going live and thinking you're live hey y'all I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop today we're gonna to be talking about resawing and this should be a very interesting one usually this is the time in the video where I will tell you about upcoming events and places where I'm going but we haven't done that in a while so I'm not gonna do that today <laughs> um, but if you are watching this live Go ahead and throw your questions in the chat. My wife will uh, be cataloging those and being able to offer those up. And if you are watching this recorded, then look down in the description and you'll see a list of all of the questions. And beside all the questions, there should be a timestamp that will get you roughly close to where it is in the video so that you'll be able to uh, jump to those if you want to find out. But today we're going to be looking at resawing. And what exactly is resawing? Resawing is cutting a board again. I know, kind of cool. Huh? Make sure I'm getting this right. Switch over to this one. Oop, not that one. This one. I switched up my buttons. So here we've got a board, and if I'm going to rip it, I'm going to go lengthwise with the grain across the face of the board. If I'm going to cross cut it, I'm going to go across the board, across the grain, cross cut. Hey, there we go. And then resawing is cutting down the edge and cutting it like this. So we actually want to come in from this side and cut all the way down this and take two boards, uh, take one board and make it into two or three or four. And historically, the way you made veneer is that you cut it off of there. And so tonight, I'm going to attempt to cut off a piece of uh, around 16th inch thick all the way down this board. And so this will be kind of the experiment we're doing. But I'm going to talk through several different methods of making the cut and how it all happens. Um, so if you have any questions or something particular you want me to hit, throw those in the comments. And I'm going to probably be touching on those. Um, but tonight, I want to be looking at doing it with both the handsaw, uh, which we talked about last week, a handsaw is a panel saw, but longer. Um, it's at least, usually about 26 inches or longer is a handsaw. Uh, this one has a, uh, this one has five PPI. And then I've got this, which is my Rubo style frame saw. And uh, this is, um, I generally when I'm going to be resawing something that's like six inches or thicker, I pull this out. Or if I'm going to be doing a lot of resawing, this is just a little bit easier on the body and just it's easier to, to march down through it with it. Uh, this particular one is from a kit uh, from Blackburn Toolworks. And uh, I have the 36 inch version, which for most cutting, that's about the full stroke. Uh, some people like to go to the 48, which is a foot longer, uh, but I like about the 36. Um, and also mine has a two inch blade height and you can get them up to four inches tall. Uh, Blackburn Toolworks has a whole list of sizes that you can choose from. Um, Bad Axe Tools also sells a kit, uh, but theirs I believe is only 40 inch, but I could be wrong on that. Um, I haven't done any of those in a while. But if you want to see this, I actually have several videos on making the frame saw. Um, I actually I made, uh, see I made one out of a, Black, out of a uh, Bad Axe Tool kit. I made the original one out of Poplar until I broke it. And then this one out of white oak. Of course, what else? Um, and so I want to kind of talk about the, the differences in that. But first thing we need to do is talk about holding this in place and how do we... Ready? Yeah. Um, so Terulian asked, I've heard of jointing a saw. My Distin Rip saw has a crown or arc that makes the central teeth about an eighth inch higher than the teeth on either end. How do you sharpen a saw like this? Yes, um, and when you joint the saw, well, we're going to be talking about sharpening here in a minute, but usually the first step is running a file along the teeth, and that makes all the teeth the same height. What he's talking about is a crown in the saw, where these teeth are up a little bit higher, and so all the teeth are in a bit of an arch. And that's actually really normal. Uh, for most saws that are like 24 inches or longer, there tends to be a crown in the teeth, where these are higher. And the reason for that is it makes it so that only one point in the saw is contacting. Um, and so it makes it just a little bit easier so you're not running all your teeth across a wider board. Um, and the way you joint it is you just put the file on there and you run it. And it's only going to be touching the high tooth in any particular area. Now that means that the whole length of the file is not going to be touching. It's only going to be you know, an inch or two in the middle that's actually touching it. But as you rock it, it's going to be touching, the touching all the teeth. Some people like to put all the pressure on the front of the file. Some people like to put all the pressure on the back of the file. It really doesn't matter that much. Um, but yes, it is going to ride that crown up and over. Ow! Hmm. Stab the saw. And yeah, I got a little bit of blood. It's sharp. <laughs> um, but that is normal. Um, and that, that is, it's very common for your, your hand saws. Um, but for the frame saws, it's perfectly flat, which is actually something we're going to be talking about a little bit later. 
Usually when I'm going to be resawing, I stop and I sharpen the saw. It's just worth it to have a sharp saw. If your saw isn't sharp, resawing is a pain in the backside. I'm going to show you that a little bit today because this one intentionally isn't very sharp. And this one I just sharpened a couple days ago, so it's really nice and clean. Um, usually for me, if I'm going to resaw, you know, uh, 30 board feet worth of face, then uh, then I'll, I'll uh, uh, eh, now probably somewhere around like 15 to 20 board feet worth of face I'll resharpen. But that depends on how hard. Like I just did a cedar log uh, with this, and um, I sharpened this just before that, and I've done a little bit of other resawing since then, and so it's gotten dull. But that at, uh, that cedar just didn't tear this up very far. Whereas the white oak um, that would go a lot faster and I'd have to sharpen it more often. Um, so let's talk about holding this in place. Put that there, don't want it to fall. Uh, usually, usually you want to resaw in line with your bench. So you want to uh, push it along the bench, that way you're not going to be going around on it. And I normally would do that other than the fact that I have other electronics and things in the way, and so I'm actually going to be resawing across the bench. Sometimes, I'll actually put the, put the board in the bench in the end vise and I'll still uh, go with the, uh, with the bench because I have a little longer space over here. Actually, I'm move this over here because I'm going to be spending over this way a little more often today. Um, so sometimes I will resaw with the bench, but that means I've got to move my bench over farther because Whoa. my shop is really, really small. You're like choppy. Hmm. wonder what's going on with that. Well, there is a storm oh, going better. through. So. Oh, that could be what it is because um, we've got... <laughs> Yeah, who knows what's going to happen to our internet. So if we suddenly cut out, you know, that's the problem. Um, so you usually want to be going with the bench. So the answer for most people is stick it in the leg vise because the leg vise is there. And for a lot of people, that's, that's actually really good, especially if you're right-handed because in this case, I'm standing beside the bench so the bench isn't in my way. But if I want to use a frame saw, then the bench is in my way and I'm kind of off the side of it. Um, I'm not able to stand directly behind it in the leg vise. That's why I generally don't use the leg vise. Now, if you look at Shannon Rogers on the hand tool school, he actually puts his in a leg vise farther away. And so with it all the way over there, he actually saws beside the bench. And he's weird. More weird than I am. <laughs> no, a lot of people like to do that. Um, so it's one of those personal preference things. I don't like sawing beside the bench, and so I don't like doing it in the leg vices. I'd rather do it in my end vise where I can work out here and have far more room around it. Um, yeah. Then we need to look at the positioning of the wood in the vise. Let me switch this one over. So with this one, I can put this in here. And now I can saw with my bench, and I can go along that. But the problem is the board is sticking straight up. And if I try and cut here, I have all these fibers sticking straight up. And so with those fibers sticking up, they're going to want to catch the teeth. However, if I can lean the board over this way, now when my saw goes over that way, the fibers are sticking this way, and so the saw coming along isn't going to be catching those fibers. So usually when resawing, you want to take the saw and lean it a little bit. Unfortunately, if I'm going to do it with the bench, that means I have to do it vertical. It means it's going to be catching the board and being a lot more herky-jerky. So today, I'm actually going to go across the bench and just be a little more careful. It means I'm going to be moving my bench around, as I saw, but it's going to allow me to tilt the, uh, the board. Any questions right now? Um, there was a clarification earlier. Where did it go? Corman said, is that why it looks like your arm is rocking across the board from time to time? Yeah, and I'll be showing you that a little bit later. Um, you, you, you kind of think about the saw being perfectly flat as it cuts across. And what you want to do is you want the, your arm to be in a bit of an arc. Uh, you know, when you're sharpening, you want it to be nice and flat. But when you're, when you're sawing, you want it to be in a bit of an arc. So it's, it's contacting at different points. So rather than just being perfectly flat like a board, you're, as you're cutting at a different spot in the curve so that you're able to put more force into individual teeth as opposed to putting all the force on all the teeth at the same point. The other nice thing about that is if each tooth is only cutting at its max capacity for a little bit, then you're not going to be filling up all the gullets as it goes through the board. And so your, each tooth is just going to fill up its gullet at its time to cut 
And then when it goes out the other side, it can eject that out of there. That way you're not clogging up the saw. That actually causes the saw to veer more if it's clogging up. The only place for the dust to get out is out the sides of the plate, and so it pinches up on the saw and starts to push the saw one way or the other. Is that a super chat? There is, from Nate Long. Nate Long. Thanks, man. Okay. Ooh, do we have a mom joke? I'm looking. I'll be setting this up while you... Home while she's now at my aunt's house, so that means I get to run back and forth after work. So, and then get caught in a downpour, which is why if it's lagging. So For those of you who don't really know, well. her mother just had a heart transplant. Yes. So she, she's doing really well. Really, oh, I got a microphone. Really, really well. Um, probably in the next month, she should be pretty independent and on her own. Um, she's come a long way, so thank you. Um, yeah, so that's why I was running late tonight. I had to run to the drugstore and pick up some things. Okay, I'm trying to find my mom jokes. Hang on. Unless you have one off the top of your head right now. Not right now. Not right now. Trying to get this marked up. If I was smart, I would have done this before. Here. While you do that, I'm going to oh. show. Are you ready? Yeah, ready? Yep. I once saw a theatrical performance about puns. It was a play on words. Ooh, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> so here we go. Today we're going so to be cutting you, this. So thank you, Nate. Yeah. Um, you are the man. You know that, Nate? So today we're going to be cutting this. I don't see if you know if you can see that line on there, but we're going to be cutting about an eighth inch off of this. I'm going to maybe get that a little closer to that. I'm going to run right up tight that line and get ourselves a nice thin line coming off of that. So to do that, we're going to put the board in here and I'm going to lean it away from me. Bring the camera over here and show you a little bit better. Oh my gosh. But what's going on? on the chat. Focus on this spot here slide against my thumbnail there and that my thumbnail allows me to push it one way or the other and I'm going to hold the blade off and I'm going to let it ride on my thumb just nicking the tops until it's in. Once it's in now I can go to town on it and I'm going to go down a little ways following the line on my side not going too far on this side. Starting is often the most difficult part And for those of you wondering about curving saws, I'll be talking, curving planes, I'll be talking about those in a little bit. So I've come down this way a little bit. Now I'm going to refocus. I'm going to come down this line a little farther. And the more we get into it, the more I'm going to push it. Ooh, I'm getting a little off course. So I'm actually moving a little bit off course. You might be able to see that. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to twist the saw pushing these teeth against this side of the cut. I'm going to back up a little bit and just scratch it down until I get myself back where I want to be. Now I've widened out the gap a little bit on that side. And there. Now we're all the way across there. Now I can cut on this side and start to come down. Once you get it started and it's in the curve, it goes pretty well. Okay, there. Now we have it started. I've come all the way across the top and I've come all the way down the side. I made a little bit of a mistake there as I started to go off, but I backed up, I cleaned it up, and cleaned off the saw. As long as this start here is pretty good, the rest is going to follow if your saw is in, in a good condition. But if you don't get this start correct, if this, if this start has any problems to it, it's going to be pushing the saw one way or the other, and you're going to be going all over the place as you go on it. Also, you want to keep in mind that as you're sawing, you are in line with it. The saw is in line with my arm, my elbow, and my shoulder, so that the whole thing is moving in line. If you're in the way, you're going to get the saw doing one of these things, and you're going to be going off course. If you're pushing on the saw, you're going to be making the saw go off course. If you actually have a loose grip on the saw, you want to let the saw do the work. So any questions so far? Uh, yeah. So you're trying to talk about a curved plane and a curved saw and all I'm that? I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, so Alan Smith asks, do you, go half, do you go down halfway or a third of the way on the first 
cut down the board? Um, right there. That's where I'm going to turn and rotate around. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is sometimes I'll even grab a pencil here and I'll mark that I've come down this far. I'm going to put a mark on this, this side of the board that I've come down that far. And so I know the other side of the board I'm down that far, so I'm probably going to cut down to somewhere around here this time and then turn it around and do it again. So I'm only going to go a little ways. The more you turn it, the easier it is to follow the line. The less you chance that there's... And there, I'm down to that pencil mark that I just drew over here. Um, and in this case, I'm actually going to take it down a little bit farther. Just because I'm actually leaning this board a little bit more than I normally do. So to give you a little example, the first cut was from here to here. And the second cut is from here to here. And my next cut will probably be like here, here to here. And so you can see how I'm doing about that much each time I rotate the board. So now I'm going to put a mark here, and that's how far I want to come down on this side. I can put this on here, and we can continue on down. And I'm going to keep doing this back and forth. And this way I basically have a kerf on the back side. That open kerf that's sticking out is, allowing, is guiding the saw down there. And all I have to worry about is the line on my side. If I let my cut go down farther than I've gone on the back side, then there's nothing guiding the saw back there. And there. Now I've come down to match basically that line. And so my next one will be a zigzag about there. You can see how that will kind of continue down. But at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to using the frame saw and show you some of the differences in that. If you don't have a frame saw, don't worry. It's a little bit faster, it's a little bit easier, but a good hand saw will really do you. As long as the hand saw is sharp, it'll clean up just as fine and do it just as quickly. Um, the frame saw just uses more of your whole body rather than just one arm. You can put both arms into it. What questions we got while I reset that? Well, we have a super chat from what, what? Jesse Taylor. Hey, thank you, Jesse. James, just want to say thanks. Your videos are always helpful. Thanks for being generous with your knowledge. And thanks, Mrs. Wright, generous with your knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Sarah, for being here and keeping an eye on this crazy guy. <laughs> we don't want him to get out into the wild. <laughs> Feral James. <laughs> You already are. What are we talking about? <laughs> okay, hang on. I'm find, hanging. I'm hanging. I gotta find a mom joke. Oh, mom joke. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, while she's doing that, um, when you're working on your frame saw, stick a uh, screwdriver in there and really crank the sucker down. The stiff blade isn't going to move around on you too much. And then eyeball down it and make sure that your blade isn't twisted. If your blade's twisted, you're not going to be able to cut a straight line. Um, some of the old folks would actually put the saw up and put winding sticks on here to make sure that the blade is perfectly straight. Um, but for most resawing, I can just eyeball down it and make sure it's straight enough, and it's good to go. Oh, yeah, what's the mom joke? All right. Why do optometrists live so long? Why? Because they dilate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> think about that one. <laughs> now this is the fun part. You can see how fast this goes down. So I'm going to start here on this curve. The first couple strokes will go really nice and quickly. Now my blade board is moving on me because I'm just pinching the bottom of it. Actually move this down a little bit more. Grab the board a little bit stiffer. And you may notice, when I pull back, I go high, I let the nose of the, the saw go down. And so as I'm pushing forward on the start of my saw, I'm cutting back here. And by the end of the stroke, 
I'm back up into here. And so my hands are down and I'm cutting on my side of the cut with more. Kind of letting the saw rock with it. That's just enjoyable. It uses a lot less, um, a lot less pressure because you're using your whole body for it. And so I'm making sure that as I rock, I'm actually rocking my feet back and forth. You might notice my feet are quiet. Had a lot of people complaining about my uh, clogs being loud. I haven't put leather on, leather on them yet. But as I'm rocking back and forth, I'm actually shifting between my feet. So I'm not just pushing my hands back and forth, but I'm allowing my whole body to get into it. And so if I really wanted to, I could kind of keep the hands in place and let my body do the work. Um, but let's flip this thing over and come at it from the other side. What questions we got? All right. Um. All right, Jonathan Haney asked, which saw does better at the other's job, rip cut or cross cut? Um, most of the time, a cross cut saw will treat you better than a rip saw um, because it's easier to rip with a cross cut than just a cross cut with a rip saw. You'll get a cleaner cut no matter what you do. The exception to that is resawing. With resawing like this, because you're going over such a large space, the teeth of a crosscut saw want to follow the grain. And it is very easy for a crosscut saw to give you some really wild curfs inside the board, which we'll be talking about that a little bit later too. And so if you're resawing, it's definitely worth your time to get yourself a ripped saw. It's going to save you a ton, ton of time. You're going to get a cleaner cut. It's one of these things that a crosscut saw just does not do well. But for general use, a crosscut saw is better than a rip saw. So let me show you starting this frame saw. Um, so I'm going to put this on. Actually, no, I'm going to leave it on this camera for right now because you don't need to see the close-up. So I'm going to set it right on that line, let it bounce. And the problem with that is I really can't lift this saw up. So like with one of those, I would actually lift it up and just let it scratch the top. And I could do the pull back stroke method. But I find that tends to let the saw bounce around since nothing's controlling it up there. So with this, I set it in place and with one clean stroke, I just go just like four or five teeth into it. And we're a little ways into the saw. And so you can see how here I'm just a little ways in, but with just that, that quick jerk forward locks it down in. Now with this, I need to be careful because it's harder to do just one side or the other. Now we're all the way across the top. I'm going to cut my line down a little ways. And just like that, we're into the board. I'm going to take this off and do a rotation of the board. Oh, I love how that follows the line. Especially since this is sharp. This saw being sharp just makes it so much cleaner. It just it flows through the wood. Now, the next thing I really need to talk about is when you're cutting, you don't want to push the saw. There's a tendency, especially with a, uh, with a hand saw, there's a tendency to push the saw and get your weight into it and really drive the saw in. And for a lot of cuts with your ripping and your cross cutting, it's not optimal, but it'll still get the job done. When you're doing resawing, if you push the saw, you're going to do some crazy things. Because what happens is if you push the saw and there's pressure up at the nose holding it, the saw does this. And a lot of times it'll do that inside the cut. And what will happen is you'll be following the line perfectly on your side. And the other side of the board is following the line perfectly. But then when it opens up, you get this scoop out the middle because the saw was veering inside. And most of the time, the reason it's veering inside is because you're pushing the saw. You're putting force into the saw, and the saw has nowhere to go but to either side. And so it starts scratching out one side or the other and gets farther and farther and farther to that side until eventually you get this massive scoop out of there. With a, with a uh, uh, frame saw, it's a little bit harder to do that. I let the, saw, I let the saw's weight do the work. And... Oops, And I, just, I have a loose group on here. You can see on my hands, they're loose here, and then I'm pulling back. I'm 
I'm just letting the saw do the work. I'm not forcing it down in. Okay, I went too far on that one. That's one of the things with the resaw, with the Rubo frame saw. It really gets exciting. And I'm following the line dead on there. So here, let me show you how far we've got on this. Is don't know if you can see this, but we've got about two inches here, about an inch and a half here. So right now our line is like there and there. So we have this little space in between to cut out. So I'm going to do one cut that will take out about this much work. And then I'm going to flip it around and do off the rest of this in the final cut. Okay. Got a question? No. We have, well, yes, but we have a super chat you need to address. Oh, we got a super chat. Yes. Sweet. What do we got? So from James Franks, it says, always a pleasure to see a new Wood by Wright video. Even better to see it live. Woot woot. Thanks, man. So. What's the mom joke? Uh, hang on. So I went to the zoo yesterday and saw a baguette in a cage. The zookeeper told me it was bred in captivity. <laughs> well, there's a reason I married her. <laughs> we don't know we why. We need to do a shirt with the mom joke. Mom joke woodworking. We have, we have shirts coming out soon. They're in the printing right now. And they're, they're a Venn diagram with um, dad jokes and woodworking. And so it's dad jokes, grown. Uh, woodworking jokes, knock, knock. Um, jokes, woodwork, or dad woodworking, manly, and in the middle, of course, wood by right. Um, so <laughs> they'll be coming out here soon. We'll have a post coming out on that. that well, year. I think they've created the next shirt on here because apparently they're the Knights of the White Oak or something. <laughs> <laughs> the Knights that say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could be Knights and Clogs. That's it. Okay, so let me show you how this goes. So you can see the line there. Okay, you cut down that. Now we're going to rotate this one more cut. Once it actually cuts all the way through, we put that in here. I love those first couple strokes that really chop down in there. Oop, there it goes. That broke a little earlier than I expected. So now the big question. We're going to open this up and see what it looks like inside. So I'm going to put this here. I have no idea. Is the cut good? Is the cut bad? Is it smooth? Is it not? Let me just focus here and make sure we're good and focused. And let's open it up and see what we get. <laughs> That's pretty decent. Got a little bit of a ridge here, but uh, that was, that's where the last saw stroke broke through. But you can see all the, the, the saw cuts are cross hatched. So some of them are going this way, some of them are going this way, some of them are going this way. And it's giving you a fairly clean inside surface. So, yeah, that is what resawing should look like when you break it apart. A few plain, a few plain strokes, and that'll be down to nice and clean. And I just did yesterday. I did, let's see, it was six um, oak boards, uh, three and a half inch by four foot long. So that comes out to, <sighs> brain stopped working, eight, 16, 24 feet by three inch. So 24 feet worth of resawing by three inch wide. Um, and with a frame saw, it was, I want to say like, 25, 30 minutes worth of actual sawing to go through that much. It goes pretty quickly. Then you have to plane it down, smooth it down. So what questions we got now before I move on to the next step? <laughs> oh, big tip. Before putting the saw away, always take the pressure off. I always forget about that and I'll come back like a day later like, ooh, I still have pressure on. What's next? Um. Sorry, the chat's very humorous right now. <laughs> I, I'm serious, we got your next shirt already. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out the night should have froze. Um, so Perez Hernandez had asked, is there any difference between a 6 TPI and a 5 TPI saw? Not particularly. Um, usually, You want to go the smaller number, the better. Um, I like a 4 or 5, but a 6 really isn't that much farther off. 
It's going to be a little bit slower, but you get a little bit, a little bit cleaner cut. So six of one half dozen another. Um, you got another question, Ray? I have a couple, so. But let's do one more, and then I'm going to talk about curfew. Um, Harold Schultz had asked, do you recommend wax or oil to help it slide along as you cut? Um, you know, I generally don't wax the saw, but I mean, I do if I'm working on some either stuff that's clamping down on me or causing me problems. Um, usually if it's binding up and I'm thinking, wow, I should wax this, that's usually a sign that I've caused it to curve inside the cut and I've really been forcing it. So yeah, needing wax usually means I messed up. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I have one or the other, I like wax. I use um, this stuff, which is my hard wax. Um, and I have a video on making your own paste wax. This is, um, I want to say, if I remember correctly, it's two parts wax, one part oil. Um, but I have this block that I've had for almost two years. My last block was a little one, lasted me a little over a year. Um, but this is usually what I'm going to then do them up with. And usually, I'm going to clean them up every month or so I'm going to do this because that also prevents rust on, rust on the buildup. And the next time you use it, it's like, woo, this saw slides. This is nice. Um, but for a, uh, for a small, thin blade like this, this is only two inches wide, it doesn't bind up very much. If I were to have a four inch wide, it might bind up a little bit more. So yeah, good question. Um, so now the next question I get all the time is, why are my planes so dusty? Um, is what about a curving plane? And when I first got into hand tools, and I was looking at making a, uh, the frame saw. I got the frame saw and the curving plane kit. Uh, this became, uh, if you look at these historically, they were called rabbit planes or rabbit saws. Uh, excuse me, uh, rab rabbiting plane saws, rabbiting plane, rabbit saws. They were called rabbit saws, there it is. Um, because you would use this to cut one edge of the rabbit and then you would change its width and you'd cut the other dimension of the rabbit. And so this would do the two pieces of the rabbit, and then you get the stick out of it. So you can actually use this to make your rabbits. But uh, Tom Fidgen, um, he found out that if he went around the board, and so he actually sawed into the board and made a kerf all the way around the board, then the, the frame saw would track much better and would follow much easier. And a lot of people really like that because the, having a kerf on there holds the blade in and so the saw doesn't want to move as much. It isn't a guarantee. Your saw can jump the kerf. Your saw can get out and go wild. <laughs> and saws gun wild. Um, <laughs> 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 April Fool's <laughs> next year. <laughs> um, yeah, it can still get out of the kerf. It's not a guarantee that it's going to work. And in all honesty, it's another step. But if you're first getting into hand tools and you're trying it out and you're not really great with a saw to begin with, then this may help you. It's just a good safety net that allows you to go really well. I don't use it much because, uh, as you can see, I just track a line. And as long as I flip the board, then it tracks really nicely. And I find that flipping the board is faster than running a kerf all the way around. But there's a lot of people out there who swear by it and absolutely love having a kerfing plane. Um, so you might not might like it. If you want to see it, I have a video actually I'm making um, this one what, about four years ago? It's been a while. So yeah, that was a that was a really fun kit. And this actually this kit came from Blackburn Tool Works. What's the next question? Um let's see. Tom was Asked, do you recommend using two hands in the saw or just one? I've tried both and produced similar results. Um, if you're talking about the frame saw, yeah, two hands. Um, most frame saws have these knobs on it, and so you grab those. And the nice thing about the knobs is they, they stop you from forcing the saw, and you can grab either side like this and run it. Um, on mine, I actually switched it around yeah, to put the, the handles on it. Um, and I really like that. It just gives me a little bit more control, makes it a little bit easier, and plus my hands are just used to holding a handle. And so I put handles on it. I really like them. And if, if I made another one, I would, I would put handles on it because I, I like that. It's just it's more work, but it gives you your end of the saw. 
Uh, and that also brings me to the question of do you have this with a push stroke or a pull stroke? And I have settled on having it on a push stroke. I have tried it back and forth. I've tried up and down. Um, but it really depends on which way do you lean the board. And so if I'm leaning the board away from me, then I want to push it. If I'm leaning the board toward me, then I want to pull it. The problem is if I'm leaning the board toward me, I can't see my line because it's underneath the board. And so I like pushing it because now I can see the line and I can track it easier. Because if you can see a line, you can follow it. So I keep mine on, on the, the push stroke. But the nice thing about frame saw is if you ever do want to pull it, there. <laughs> There's handles on both ends because you get knobs here. Um, you know, with this one, you're not going to pull it. This, this is just, this is not comfortable. Um, just trust me on that. It's not, not comfortable. <laughs> What's the next question? Sorry. The chat must be going wild. It is crazy. <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to keep track. <laughs> and then I got... If we missed your question, go ahead and post. Well, actually, Sarah is keeping a list. So I don't know. I'm, tr I'm trying. Yeah. There were some curfing questions, and I didn't ask them because I'm assuming you just answered a bunch of them. Maybe. Go for it. Um... So, and then I've got life going on on the side here that I'm trying to keep tabs on. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Harold Golden had asked, does the, play, does the blade of the frame saw have very much of a set to the teeth? Would a white um, set tend to let the, let the blade wander more? Well, the more set you have in the saw, the more you control you have over the saw. In other words, you can, you can use it to kind of scratch away the side and, and change your, your, your curve. Also, the more set you have, the more chance you're going to get that curve inside the board if you start overforcing the saw. So less set means less control, but also means less problems, and less set also means it's an easier saw to push because you're taking less material out. Um, and so on mine, I actually have a fairly minimal set on my frame saw. Um, I don't have too much on there. Now, on my hand saw, I actually have a pretty heavy set on these. And that's because there's a taller plate on here. And so the more set on that gives me the ability to control. There's, there's less that's holding onto the plate. Um, so I do like to have a good bit of set on this, but not as much on my frame saw. Um, but again, if you're a beginner, I'm usually going to tell you put a little bit more set on the saw because it allows you to fix that, the, the marks. It, just gonna, it means you're going to do a little bit more work to remove material, and you have to be a little more careful of not over pushing the saw. But it does give you that little bit more control over the saw. So hope that answers you. So there's a request if you could show a close-up of the curving plane while you still have it. Oh, sure. My curving plane. If you, uh, if you type into the search engine, would by right curving plane, um, you will come up with, and uh, I didn't have any lumber thick enough at the time, and so this is, um, I don't remember what this is. I want to say it's a mahogany, but I can't remember what. And then, of course, white oak in the middle. I really like that two-tone, how it came out on there. Um, and so I can loosen these up, and this whole thing then slides on the fence. And one of the things I love about the Blackburn kit is it has these really deep gullets on the teeth. Um, and he actually comes in and files them out. And I've sharpened this one a couple times. I need to come back in and file them without a rat's tail. And what the, the deep gullets on that do is they allow all of the dust to fill into the gullet as opposed to jamming this. Because that's one of the problems with the curving plane. The bigger gullet, you have more space for the, the stuff to get into. So there's my curving plane. What's next? We have another super chat. Hey, Tom West. Nice. Thank you, man. Uh, so, and I think I've asked Tom's question. So, hang on. I've got to find my mom joke unless Hail you have one. James, King of the White Oak. I apparently am missing something. You are missing chat. a lot. I'm going to have to go back and read You're this You're going to have to go back and read <laughs> this one. Active chats are always a lot of fun. Here comes the mom joke for you. I know. Some of them I got to, I'm not sure if I've already asked, so... That's part of my problem. Oh, if we switched from pounds to kilograms overnight, there would be mass confusion. <laughs> there already is forget, mass confusion. <laughs> I forget to 
convert them to a question sometimes when I'm reading. <laughs> so what's the next joke? That is. What's that? That was. It was supposed to. Oh, be not a joke. the next joke. The next question. Oh, I was like, <laughs> uh, Mr. Q. What did Mr. Q say? When it comes to resawing rip saw, do you recommend more slash smaller teeth versus less slash larger teeth? Resawing rip saw. Well, if you're resawing, it is a rip saw because you're going with the grain. Um, and so, in which case, the bigger the teeth, the better generally. Um, you know, if I were regularly resawing boards that are six inches wide, I might actually commission someone, or I might actually refile my own and make a saw with teeth that are somewhere around two PPI, or maybe like uh, uh, like one and a quarter PPI, with really really big teeth, um, because the bigger the tooth, the more material you're taking out, the faster you're going. Uh, the bigger the gullet, so you have more space for dust to fill up. So most of the time, the bigger the tooth, the easier it is. The smaller the tooth, the cleaner the cut is. Um, but in general, I'm going to be going with something bigger, the better. Hmm. Sorry. What's next? Oh, you got family things going on? Uh, the, there's all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Life see. is crazy right uh. now right here. <laughs> Nick L. asked, when you sawed the tree with the frame saw, did it have the same set as this saw, or did you put on a heavier set blade? Oh, uh, if you're talking about, I was, and I got I to redo the video on that. Um, I was going to do a video on cutting lumber out, because uh, I have um, a couple logs that I want to turn into lumber uh, from a birch tree that we cut down. And no, I used oh. this one. Um, so, big saw. Um, and what he's asking about having more set in it for a uh, um, for green trees, and the nice thing, or the reason for that is, the green wood will want to bind the saw more, and so you have to be a little bit more a um, little more careful with that. Um, and so, if I had another saw to dedicate to that, I might put more set into it. Um, but this is only a two-inch tall blade, so it's really not going to cause that much of an issue. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I, I probably could, but uh, I don't have another saw to dedicate to that. So it's really not that big of a deal to have the, the minimal set I have on there because there are straight logs and it's not going to cause much of a problem. If I were working with like branch stock, um, branches that have been sticking out, they have a lot of tension build up in them over the years. And when they come down and you start cutting them, that board wants to release from that tension it's been holding. And uh, that can actually cause boards to pinch down and actually bind up on the saw so you can't move the saw at all. And I, I have a, uh, there's, there's a lot of, of stories of, of saws being stuck in the wood and not being able to get them out. And uh, um, you'll even see that sometimes with chainsaws where it binds up on the bar and clamps it down. But yeah. What's next? Uh, let's see. Dan second S. Any tips on resawing with a Ryoba? Ryoba, however you say it. Um, don't. <laughs> if this is just not long enough to, to resaw with. Um, unless, you know, you, you could resaw a board this size with it, but it's going to take you a long time. The, what you want is generally you want, you want the, the saw to be three times longer than the board you're cutting through, at minimum, at absolute minimum. So this being 36 inches, the maximum I'd want to cut through is a 12 inch size board. And this being 10 inches means a little over three inches is about the maximum I'd possibly want to cut with this. And that being said, that, that's going to take a long, long time. Um, even the, the Japanese would not resaw with this. Uh, they would have a whaleback saw or something of that nature that was designed for resawing, um, designed for hogging out lar large material. So resawing with Ryoba is incredibly difficult, um, <laughs> to say the least. It is very, very slow and very, very tedious. And one of the other problems with them is uh, because they cut on the pole stroke, the steering force is on the opposite side of the board from you. So you have to put a lot of saw into that force to correct it, to correct, to correct it, to correct the saw. 
And so if this isn't perfectly straight right off the bat, it's going to be very hard to hold it on track because it likes to follow its exact track down. And you have to put a lot of force into the saw in order to make it curve. Um, and so that doing a, a long resaw with it, that would become very, very difficult. So it, it's not an optimal saw for resawing. Um, and even if you go to the Japanese, uh, they have other saws other than a rail before uh, resawing. What's next? Um, let's see. I'm going to ask the questions that are on topic first. Oscar Nelson Gutierrez from Argentina asked, Hi, can you tell me the thickness of the frame saw blade in millimeters? He's going to make his own. Hmm. This one is, let me touch it over to millimeters. Uh, this one is 0.9. Right, 0.9, let me put it in the back here. Point 0.9. That's the thickness of that one. Uh, whereas this is a little bit thicker, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is... Oh, that's right, this one's tapered. Um, a good panel saw is actually thinner back here. Back here is 0.7 millimeters, whereas up here is 1.05. Um, so I've lost... Um, what, 0.3 millimeters from front to back. So almost a third of the thickness disappears. Uh, and that's that's um, good hand saws are ground down so that they are thinner on the back than they are at the edge of the plate, which makes them very expensive. What's next? All right, hang on. I'm hanging. Uh, Lawrence. Lawrence Bassett asks, can you resaw with a limb saw? A limb saw usually is a crosscut blade. Um, and limb saws tend to have a reverse camber, so the, uh, the teeth are rounded this way. So, I mean, theoretically you can resaw with any saw, but man, would that be a pain. It would not be a fun, um, a fun cut at all. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, I would probably go to a uh, antique store or something like that and find a hand saw and refile the teeth to what I would want and use a limb saw. <laughs> What's next? Uh, let's see. Heron Golden said, are we going to see James smooth that piece of veneer? Oh, you want me to? Yeah, um, clamping veneer is very, very difficult, but I have a little bit of a trick that I do. Uh, which I can't remember where I first saw it. I gotta grab the amazing material, a carpet tape. And so I'll put the carpet tape down. And this makes it a lot easier to then just stick the board down to that. And when, re when planing it down, and with this, I can plane down to most anything. Uh, no, you're not sharp. You are. Let's try that. Here. Bring this up. This one's not sharp. Wow, it's dull. <laughs> not sharp is an understatement. But it's a little heavier cut. So I can use that to get through the vast majority. And then I'm going to come in with my smoothing plane. <laughs> Problem is right here, I've got several marks on this side. And this was, if you remember right off the bat, I had that spot where I had to go back and correct my marks. I had to go back and correct the cut. And that's where these came in because I used the side of the teeth to correct it here and bring it back into line. And so I'd have to plane it all down more to get rid of that. But now the rest of this is nice and smooth. So yeah, there's planing down with that. What do we got? Um, 
Alan Smith super chatted. So we're going to Woo! Thanks, that. Alan. Um, Back from uh, Bible study. So he says, one, sorry, I'm sorry, me lady Sarah. Called me the gnome instead of the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, can you ask James the name of the kit supplier of the frame saw? Yes, this is from Blackburn Toolworks. Um, and he actually has um, three different kits you can get for it. He has a 24 inch, a 36 inch, and a 48 inch. Um, and they come in different widths. The 36 is a two inch wide blade, the 48 is I want to say a three inch wide, but it might be a four um, tall blade. Um, and I think the 24 is like an inch and a half tall. Um, but it comes with the end plates, the pins, and the drawings for the, the frame itself. Um, it's personally my favorite of the kits I've seen, and the reason why I bought that. Um, but Blackburn, uh, uh, um, Bad Axe Toolworks from up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, they also have it, but they only have the one size, the 40, or do they have the 36? I haven't looked in a while, so I don't know. Um, but Blackburn Torx is also the one that makes the uh, the curving saw kit. But I think uh, Bax also has a curving saw kit, so there's a few of them out there. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Does he get a mom joke? <laughs> of course. Why is dark spelled with a K instead of a C? Why? Because you can't see in the dark. Mm. <laughs> you got any other questions? I have one off-topic question. Okay. Brad's work sponge, and I think you just hopped off. Do you still have the spring pole lathe and any plans on using it in a video? Yes, I have the spring pole lathe. It's all taken apart over there. Um, I don't have any turning videos right now, and if I did, I'm probably going to use my, uh, my treadle, uh, my flywheel lathe. Um, however, maybe late this fall, maybe next spring, I'd actually like to do some green woodworking outside, in which case the spring pole lathe is fantastic for that. Uh, maybe making a shave horse, because uh, we just built the kids a tree house, and I have this space underneath the tree house, and it's like, hmm, outdoor shop. So uh, the spring pole lathe might be moving out there to do some of that. Uh, but no, I don't have anything particularly planned for right now. Is that it? That is it. Cool. Well, um, next week is probably going to be a Q&A unless something particular comes up. Um, but here, here's an interesting one to leave you guys with. Some of the things on my shop floor. Um, focus, there you go. Is I've got these um, vacuum bags on the on the floor right now with uh, these slabs in it. And this is an upcoming project that I'm really, really getting excited about. So fun things are coming. <laughs> but uh, I think that will about do it for this week. Well, we, okay, we got one question snuck in and a super chat. Oh, okay. So super chat first for us from Dan Sackett. He says, Thanks, Thank Dan. so much for your channel. New to woodworking and found a number seven this week. Your restoration videos have been helpful. Back to flattening the soul. <laughs> Good luck. A number seven is no fun for that. Okay, ready? I'm ready. What do you call a fat psychic? What? A fortune teller. Ooh, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> All right, we're going to sneak in Tom's question real fast. It's, can you resaw large timbers with a two-man cross-cut saw like in tim timber framing? I mean, theoretically, yes. You can resaw with any saw. Uh, it would be a crazy pain to do it, um, and it would, it would want to run off track quite quickly. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> That's why uh, most... Uh, pit saws were either a large uh, frame saw or they were, well, like a crosscut saw, um, but with, with rip cutting teeth. So a little bit different there, but that would be, that would be a very painful day. <laughs> On that note, we'll wrap this one up and I'm looking forward to next time. Anything else before we go? Well, Tom just super chatted. Oh, another one? Well, thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, t-shirts are coming, so. Uh, no, he wants 
Knights of the White Oak t-shirt. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to look at this one. Maybe someone should draw up an image for Knights of the White Oak. If you draw up an image that I like and we put it on a t-shirt, um, you'll get a free t-shirt at least, plus other things. So uh, yeah, let me know. <laughs> I think that'll about do it for tonight. Uh, until next time. I guess Tom day. doesn't get a joke. Oh, well, we need a joke. Sorry, Tom. That's what I'm looking over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Quick one. Why did the tomato blush? Why? Because it saw the salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we can call it a night. <laughs> On that note, thanks for watching, everyone. This was a fun one, and I'm looking forward to next time. Bye. See you later. Bye.